Welcome to DoubleClick at Build 2021. This is a brand new type of content that we've created just for you. As developers, we like to be able to pull back the curtain and see how things actually work. And I don't know if you're anything like me, but I like to learn visually. So we got engineering leaders from across the company to pick topics from all of the amazing announcements that we had and go deeper. This content has been crafted just for you. So I'm excited to see what they're going to share with us. Let's hop in. Gabe Monroy's session told us all about building cloud native apps that run anywhere. This is a capability that's in high demand. All of our customers are asking us to do this, and it's the right thing to do. So now Brendan Burns is going to break out the trusty Lightboard and show us actually how this works. Let's go learn. Thanks, Caruana. I'm really excited to dig a little deeper on GitOps. So what is GitOps? Well, I think most of you are probably familiar with the Git part of GitOps because you're used to taking the Git repo and using it to manage your source control. That's a pretty familiar experience for a lot of developers. Maybe it's using GitHub or any other kind of Git server. The idea behind GitOps is to combine the Git with the operations so that you can actually use the exact same workflows that you're used to with your source control to manage uh, the configurations of your applications deployed to Kubernetes, deployed in ARM templates, or really anywhere where you can do infrastructure as code. And the really great thing about this is a lot of the same processes that are associated with Git, like code review, so you can have multiple people looking at the same piece of source control. Well, they all apply when you're doing the operations as well. And that leads to more reliability, sort of better understanding of the whole thing and how the whole, all the different pieces of your system fit together. So today we're going to take a little bit of a deeper look at exactly how we implement that with Arc and uh, the Azure Kubernetes service. Additionally, we're going to see how this pattern in the context of a single cluster is great for managing your infrastructure. But in the context of multiple clusters, it's even better for scaling out your operations. All right, so let's take a look at the details of what GitOps looks like. Maybe some of you are familiar with uh, you know, the JSON that's associated with uh, an ARM template, or the YAML that's associated with Kubernetes, or maybe you're even discovering BICEP which is a new way of managing uh, infrastructure as code on Azure. Well, those source control files are exactly what you're going to put into your Git repository. So you're probably familiar with taking these infrastructure as code text files and pushing them into a Git repository. Once you do that, you can turn it into a GitOps repository by adding automation. So you can do, you know, I'll draw a little gear here to represent the automation. I'm going to apologize for my gear drawing skills. They definitely could use a little bit more practice. But you're going to add some automation connected to that Git repository. And the net effect of that is every single time you push a new configuration into that Git repository, the automation is also going to notice that, and it's going to take an action. It's going to create a pod or a service, uh, and it's going to deploy your application out to the cluster. If we dive a little bit deeper into how that actually works inside of the cluster, it's an example of the operator pattern. Now, the operator pattern is basically the idea that inside your Kubernetes cluster, you're going to have a little actor. This is the operator. And it's running and taking action on behalf of you. So just like you know, someone who might actually be operating a, an old uh, you know, computer back in the 1950s before they were operating systems, we came out with the idea of an operating system to replace that operator. The operator in your Kubernetes cluster replaces a human taking action to deploy an application and becomes a process that deploys that application instead. So this operator is listening to the Git repository. It's listing at a particular branch, and this is important, we'll see in a little bit, and a particular uh, tag within that branch. And what it's basically doing is whenever it notices a change between what it sees inside of the cluster, so it's looking at the various pieces that are inside of the cluster, um, and when it notices a change between the description of what should be in the cluster that's in the Git repository and the actual things that are inside of the cluster, it takes an action. And you can think of this sort of like a thermostat, right? So if you're familiar with the idea of a thermostat, you know, you set the temperature to 75, say, and depending on the temperature of the room, that thermostat is going to take action to either heat or cool the room to achieve your desired state. The GitOps operator is the exact same way. It's going to treat the Git repository 
as the equivalent of that temperature that you're setting. In this case, it'd be the configuration of your application. And it's going to take actions inside of the cluster to make the state of your application in the cluster match the desired state that you've expressed uh, in that GitOps repository. And the really fantastic thing about this is that the only thing that you did in order to take that action is you went and you, you, know, you wrote a new version of the text file and you pushed it into the repo. Right? And that's very familiar if you're used to doing that for code. And then the amazing thing about that is because it's in a Git repo, you get to take advantage of things like rollback. Right? So if it turns out that this configuration is bad, well, remember, this is my v2, say. In that same Git repository, I've got a v1. And I can actually come along and say, hey, you know what? I don't actually like that v2. I'm going to roll it back, and I'm going to go back to v1. And that's all I do. And then that same operator that's paying attention to your Git repository takes the action to actually make the state of the world match up to your desired state. So you know, going back to our thermostat analogy, maybe we turn the temperature up too high. We're going to take a step back, turn it down. That same operator will, will fix, you know, sort of fix the state of the world to be the desired state um, that we want to see. Now, the great thing about this is not just that you're doing um, you know, infrastructure as code and declarative configuration in a really simple way, and you can manage your cluster um, just using you know, git push and git pull. There's also a lot of best practices that you can associate with GitOps that make it even better. We're going to actually erase this to take a little bit of a better perspective, get a little more space to take a look at some of the practices you can put into place with GitOps. Um, and then we'll dive into the scale aspects and how you can use it to expand to manage multiple clusters at once. All right, so now you're taking your configurations and expressing them as text files in that Git repository, and you've got your GitOps automation set up so that you know, any changes that you push into that repository end up as you know, configurations of your cluster. Um, but what can we add on top of that? Well, the number one thing that we can add on top of that is human oversight, right? So I think in source code, it's quite familiar at this point that code shouldn't merge without it having gone through a code review. This is the whole pull request process on GitHub. And the great thing about this is instead of just having a single person's eye, it's my best eye that I got, instead of having a single person's eyes on the code, now we can actually have multiple people's eyes on the code. And by having multiple people looking at the change and reviewing the change before it gets committed and before it gets manifested out into our production environment, we have a better chance of catching errors. So that's a huge step forward in terms of reliability because a single person can make mistakes. It's much harder for two people to make the same mistake uh, when looking at the same change. Now, in, as long as we're thinking about fixing errors and that sort of thing, one of the other things that we can add is testing. So I think, again, it's familiar into the source code environment that you're going to add unit tests before this code merges into Git. You can do the exact same thing with the configurations of your application. So you can say something like, there shouldn't be fewer than three replicas of my application. right? So you can assert and say, replicas will always be greater than three. right? And this is a test that you can apply to this configuration before it merges into the Git repo and before it pushes out to production. So again, just like the code review was adding validation of a human taking a look at the change to make sure that they thought it was safe, automation and unit testing, you know, the same analogies that you're using in source control, can be used to test and ensure that the configuration is valid before it gets anywhere near a production environment. So not only does GitOps make it much, much easier for your developers to push code, it actually also makes it more reliable. Finally, there's a really strong element of security as well in a GitOps environment, because the only thing that has the ability, remember, this process of going from uh, the repo out into the environment is done by automation. right? So I'll draw my gear again here. Do my best. We got a little bit of automation that's doing this. Now, it turns out that that automation is the only thing that you need to give the keys to your cluster. The only thing that needs access via RBAC to the cluster to make changes is this automation. You're, the people who are actually uh, taking action, they only need to be able to write these configuration files and be able to push them into the Git repository. This really allows a separation of concerns so that even if this person's account is compromised in some way, maybe they leave their laptop in a coffee shop or they, you know, their password gets compromised, they, are, they don't have the ability to actually modify your production cluster. It has to go through this automation process. It has to get a code review. It has to get a validation. And then it's only then is it pushed out through the access control of this automation that you have running inside of your cluster. So that's a huge improvement, not only in ease of use, not only in you know, reliability of the deployment, but also the security of the deployment as well. 
Now, I hope that gives you a perspective about what GitOps is and how it all sort of fits together. I want to take a last step and describe how GitOps enables you to scale. Now, the whole purpose of Arc and the whole purpose of what we're doing with enhanced management for Kubernetes clusters anywhere is this idea that actually Kubernetes clusters are sort of popping up all around. And I think there's a great example in the talk of the need to have clusters in various geographic locations. Um, sometimes we see it with shipping companies. You know, they need a Kubernetes cluster on a ship. You know, clearly a ship that's sailing out in the ocean, that's not going to be uh, inside one of our data centers. And there could actually be lots of ships all over the place, right? So we have lots of ships. Each one has their own Kubernetes cluster. Um, and actually managing the software, ensuring that all the software is up to date, secure, reliable um, on all of those different ships can actually be a really challenging thing, especially because you know, when the ship is in the middle of the ocean, they may not have any network. So here, I'll, you know, maybe they have one bar, one Wi-Fi bar. And if they're in the port, they've got a bunch of Wi-Fi, right? So it means that it actually not every single cluster is connected um, to the internet at any particular time. So you can't sort of rely on um, pushing things out to these environments. GitOps is a great fit for managing these clusters at scale. And the reason for that is because we have our Git repository, and it's at the center of the, uh, you know, of the configuration. It has stored in it the desired state. Now, on each of these clusters, you have the, that GitOps operator. And that GitOps operator is always watching. No matter what, it's always watching the... Uh, always watching the Git repo. Now, the good thing about that is, is if sometimes it can't watch it, if there's a network problem and it can't watch the repo, it doesn't matter. It's going to try later. Um, and so, and, But you, as a human, have the ability to just push it into this repository once, right? There's one time that you push the, uh, co the code into this repository. And no matter how many ships you add, and no matter when they're connected to the network, they'll all come back to this sort of shared home uh, Git repository in order to adopt that configuration. And so let's say over a week, all of the various ships in your fleet connect into the Git repository, and the configuration that you've placed into this single place gets pushed out to all of these different clusters without any real intervention by you other than just the first step of placing it into the Git repository and setting up GitOps in all of these clusters. Well, I hope that's given you a perspective about what GitOps is and how you can use it to build more scalable, more reliable applications and also deploy those applications to Kubernetes wherever it happens to be around the world with Azure Arc. We've had a great build so far with amazing content and more to come. Back to you, Carolana. Thank you, Brendan. I love the lightboard and being able to see that operator pattern and how to add automation to the GitOps repo. I know we're all going to want to go out and do this right away, and it's going to make our systems better for it. Now, let's move on. Amanda and Donovan came and showed us a session called Increased Developer Velocity with Microsoft's end-to-end -end developer stack. But what does developer velocity even mean? I know for sure I can't make any more hours in the day. Trust me, I've tried to do that. Enter Pierce. He's going to show us what velocity is and how the new tools are really going to make our day more productive. Let's take a look. Thanks, Caruana. I'm Pierce Bogan, Principal PM Lead on Teams Developer Tooling. And I'm here to talk to you today about how you can increase your team's velocity. So we saw a ton of announcements today. I'm a developer, you're a developer. Let's talk about what they mean for us. And so let's start with this concept of velocity. So what is velocity? Let's go back to physics. I know everybody doesn't want to return to painful memories, but let's go back there. And remember, velocity has two components, right? Like it's a rate of motion. And also it has a directional component. And the reason this matters for us as developers is we often think of speed when we think about achieving more, right? Like how can I get my build to be faster? But really what we want to make sure is not only that those things are faster for us, like our builds, like debugging, like our test runners, all of those things, we also want to make sure the right things are happening faster. And so that's what developer velocity is all about. There's really two main loops that we spend our time in as developers. There is the inner loop, and this is where we write code. This is where we hit debug, the thing builds, we test it, and we iterate. We spend most of our time here as developers. But then we also have this other loop as well, right? We have this thing called the outer loop. And this is also something we think way less about as developers, but is just as important. This is things like continuous integration, uh, testing, real-time monitoring and analytics. These are the things that actually make our apps really successful after we deliver them to our customers. And for us to achieve developer velocity, we really need to achieve them in both our inner and outer loops. So let's jump into some of the announcements today and see how they increase our team's velocity. So first, let's start with GitHub Codespaces. 
One of my biggest pain points as a developer is configuring my environment. How do I get the right things on my machine, make sure my machine has the right performance and size to handle all the workloads I need? How do I make sure that everything I'm installing doesn't conflict with each other as a full stack developer? And so this is where GitHub Code Spaces comes in, right? I can get a pre-configured development environment with just one click from my GitHub repository. And so what are the different things that make GitHub Code Spaces awesome for us as developers? So let's talk about this concept of a code space. So I click Create Code Space, and what do I get? So we have our code space, and then within that, there's different components, right? Like, first we have config. And this is where we spend a lot of our time as developers. How do we make sure our machines have the right things for us to be productive? With GitHub Code Spaces, I can specify exactly what I want in my development machine in the cloud. The next component is perp. And this matters a ton for certain types of workloads, right? If I'm a data analyst, then I'm spending a lot of time with GPU intensive workloads and I need something, a machine that's super performant. With GitHub Code Spaces, I can specify how many cores I want from two to 32. And the last component is code. This is the code we write, how we write it. With GitHub Code Spaces, my code is securely available in the cloud and I can do things like edit my code, I can debug my code, I can test my code, and when I'm ready with and comfortable with my changes, I can push those back to my GitHub repository and eventually into a pull request and part of a CI CD pipeline. So the really cool thing about GitHub Code Spaces is I can set up a code space for each of my development workloads. So if I'm building .NET web applications, I can set up a code space for that. If I'm building data-driven applications with Python, I can do that. If I'm a Node developer and I'm building a React website, I can do that as well. And for each of these, I have a separate code space. So if there's conflicts between the dependencies which these development environments require, I can isolate them in a single code space for maximum productivity. So GitHub Code Spaces enables me a development environment in the cloud with just one click. I can use that as a dedicated development environment or I can use it for quick tasks like reviewing a PR in GitHub. Let's move on to the second major announcement for us as developers, which is the Power Platform. So I talk to developers like you all the time, and the common thing I always hear, there's not enough hours in the day to build all the apps I need to build for my organization. So let's talk about how you can increase your team's velocity by scaling through low code. So let's look at an app that I might build and the architecture for that app and how that might uh, be able to be re-architected to maximize scaling application through low code in my organization. So we'll start with an app and maybe this is a desktop application. And this app is gonna have several key components. All apps have several key components, right? The first component is data. Applications revolve around data. The second is logic. Usually I'm manipulating this data in some way and then presenting it to the user finally as user interface. And so this is a typical architecture for an application that I might be building. But let me propose a new way of architecting your applications, an API first way, which is gonna help you to scale that business intelligence and logic that you write and really build different types of applications and reuse those same components. So this is kind of how I might build apps today. In the future, here's what it might look like. So I'll start with my data. So maybe this is data I have on-premises or maybe this is data I have in the cloud. The next thing I'll do is I'll build APIs, which may wrap this data, provide create, read, update, and delete operations on top of it. Maybe I'm adding additional business intelligence. And the really cool thing about APIs is APIs can be called from a million different services, right? When we put our business logic into an API, that really enables us to scale. Rather than that business logic being locked into that one app like it was in the previous model we just talked about, now I can use it for many different types of applications. So like for instance, I could still do the exact same app I was doing before and present my user interface using those APIs as my backend logic. So now that we've encapsulated our business logic and intelligence in an API, this affords us a lot of flexibility. So rather than that being locked into that one application like it was in the previous model, we can call these APIs from many different applications and leverage that business intelligence that we had from a series of apps. So maybe those are Procode apps. Maybe I'm using something like Xamarin and it's a mobile application, but I can also call all of my ProDev APIs that I just built, leverage all of that business intelligence using the Power Platform. So I can build Power Apps that call those same APIs and enable me to more rapidly build applications. I can use low code or citizen developers in my organization who are domain experts in this area, who know this space inside and out to actually build these applications, or we can build them ourselves. The other cool thing I can do with the Power Platform is it's not just about Power Apps. It's not just about UI-driven apps. There's also Power Virtual Agents and Power Automate workflows. So I can do things like build low-code bots, like for Microsoft Teams that leverage those same APIs. And so suddenly, 
all of this intelligence that was wrapped up in that one application by taking an API first mindset now we've scaled that business intelligence throughout organizations in my application, both low code and pro code. And with the Power Apps developer plan announced today, you can create, build, and run Power Apps completely for free in DevTest's context to give this concept a try for yourself. Finally, let's talk about Microsoft Teams and the Microsoft Teams development platform. Another thing I commonly learn when I talk to organizations, it's hard to build apps for the modern workforce. We're on the go, we're on our mobile device, we sometimes are in offline environments, work is more collaborative, business processes are more collaborative than ever. So how do we build applications that reflect this new hybrid work reality? So the first thing we can do with Microsoft Teams that I really love is it's got this app model that enables me to build cross-platform applications for Microsoft Teams using the technologies and tools I already know and love. So I can use React, I can use SharePoint Framework, I can use Blazor to build applications for Microsoft Teams and these applications are completely cross-platform. They run everywhere Teams runs, and they're contextual. So once they've been installed, they're available in all Teams contexts for the user. And of course, I can take advantage of collaborative features in Microsoft Teams, such as extending the chat interface with bots or maybe sending notifications to the activity feed. The second thing I really like about the Teams developer platform is the developer tooling stack. This is where we're gonna spend a lot of our time as developers, right? And the Teams toolkit for Visual Studio and Visual Studio Code enables me to create, debug, and deploy applications for Microsoft Teams. I can extend common services like tabs or bots. And the really cool thing about these developer tools is they enable me to have a super rapid inner development loop with hot reloads so I can get real-time changes as I build my app. Finally, distribution. At the end of the day, as developers, we want people to use the stuff we're building, right? And Microsoft Teams is the perfect way to distribute your apps. As I said earlier, once you install an app in Teams, it's available in all the other contexts for Teams. You can reach over 145 million daily active users for Teams and all of the users in your organization where they already are directly inside of Microsoft Teams. Really, the cool thing for me as an enterprise line of business developers, I can distribute apps and they're gonna land in the place where I know they're gonna be used. So I hope you enjoyed Build so far and you really enjoyed the announcements we had around developer velocity. Be sure to check out the rest of the sessions at Build. Back to you, Caruana. Pierce broke it down for us. Now I actually understand what developer velocity is supposed to look like. From the GitHub code spaces to the Power Platform work and that Teams toolkit for Visual Studio and Visual Studio Code, now I really understand how I can be more productive. Thank you, Pierce. Rohan Kumar talked about harnessing the power of data in our applications with Azure. Now, Pablo Castro is going to show us how we can connect our data with our analytics in a more powerful way. Let's take a look. Thanks, Karana. Look, Rohan talked about all the options we offer in Azure uh, for database systems that you can use to build your applications. Now, these databases go from NoSQL to relational databases to open source, and they're built to handle all your needs in terms of transactional volume and flexibility. Now, I want to take Cosmos DB in particular and dig into a scenario that is very common. All your transactional data is going from this app into Cosmos DB. So let's, let's kind of put, put this out. So application, if you're driving all your transactions into this database, that means that the data that is there is, has all the interesting insight that your business folks will want uh, to understand what's happening uh, with the application, what's happening to the business, to have all these questions that are analytical questions. So what do you do? You can't run the analytical workload directly there. A common pattern is to say, well, I'll, I'll write some code or, or use some ETL tool and export this data out on a regular basis. So, so that means now you have to own building this thing or pick up some tool. You have to monitor it to make sure it runs regularly. And you have to make sure it doesn't disrupt your transactional workload um, when it runs. So you can do that. But this is an area where we want to do better. And for that, we introduced this technology that we call Synapse Link for Cosmos DB. The idea of Synapse Link is that we can allow you to bring all the power of Synapse on top of the data that you already have in Cosmos DB without you having to do any of this stuff. So the pattern will be you have your Synapse workspace over here, and this will be your Cosmos DB database. And what we want to do is allow you to kind of just establish a link between these two systems. And once it's established, then you can use the analytical engines in Synapse, like Spark, and uh, SQL serverless to access all the data that you are producing on your transactional store 
with these analytical workloads, without any new tools or anything different. You have all the power of the Synapse analytical engines just targeting the data that is being produced or, uh, as transactions go through on your application. Now, the question is, how do we make it happen so that you just enable this and this um, takes place just, just out of the box? Well, to dig into this, first let me talk a little bit about the different characteristics of these of this workloads and how, how they operate on the data. So let's say you have this, this big table, right? That is uh, one of the tables in your application. So you have a bunch of rows. And um, if you first think about then the transactional workload, transactional workloads tend to do a lot of individual row lookups. Some of these lookups may end up being kind of updating some of the cells in, this, in, this, uh, in these uh, rows. Um, and uh, maybe there are some deletions here or there. Uh, but so there are a lot of kind of point lookups, point updates, point deletes, uh, and there's a lot of volume of them that are all independent. Now, on the other hand, let's think about the analytical workload. Analytical workload that doesn't take a slice. They, ideally, you want to see all your data, so across all your partitions, and you want to kind of run these huge queries that scan the entire data set, and they usually do things like, you know, they do some filters and then they do aggregates. Uh, in the end, that's the, the kind of information you want to extract is aggregate information uh, uh, for analytical purposes from the raw data that you're, you, that you're producing. So you're a lot more interested in a, in a global view, and your access path is actually fairly different. So how do we accomplish this in Cosmos DB without disrupting any of the workload you already have? So what we'll do is, inside the database, we'll keep the row store like we had before. Uh, and all the transactions will go there, and there will be no, no disruption. But at the same time, we'll maintain what we'll call an analytical store. And I draw it like this, because the important thing is the analytical store uh, that we'll maintain has a different data organization strategy that is designed specifically to allow the analytical engines to, uh, to do their job kind of by high performance and very effectively. Of course, now that we have this, we have to deal with maintaining uh, this flow so that as I'm making transactions in my database, then I, I can reflect them on the analytical store. The question is, how do we uh, manage that? Um, so let's dig into details of this. First, about the organization of the data. So we want a columnar store, and for that we use popular open source formats called Parquet uh, that uh, already has all the features for columnar organization. And the columnar data organization has a number of advantages. Like we, we can compress uh, the raw data better, uh, and then we can pack it in files that are more efficient for queries later. However, uh, it does mean that we need a, a large volume of data before we package files, so they are of good, good quality for, for queries. So now let's look into how we'll do this under the covers. Uh, so we'll have transactions coming in, and they'll hit the transactional keys in Cosmos DB. Of course, Cosmos DB will go ahead and push this into the local database, the transactional store, and then go acknowledge the write. Uh, so this is durable stored. But at the same time, what we'll also do is push this write into an in-memory buffer where we're accumulating writes that need to go to the analytical store. Um, so over time, we'll have enough of this that we can write a high-quality columnar store segment down to disk. When we're ready uh, with this, what we'll do is we'll push another one of these down, uh, and the result is a number of these, uh, of these segments. Each one of them is effectively a parquet file, uh, and they have all the data we've accumulated uh, so far. And then the analytical engines like Spark or SQL can just come query these parquet files. Of course, there are a few uh, moving parts to this that we have to account for. So first, as I mentioned before, a lot goes, a lot goes into packing these files and get them in good shape, uh, which means they're not great for updates. So at the same time, the analytical workload does a lot of updates and deletes and things like that. So to manage this, what we do is, as you're uh, making inserts, we'll propagate them. If you do deletes, what we'll do is we'll accumulate them in, a, in an invalidation file, which as it turns out is also another parquet file, such that we know which rows were deleted. And uh, in the case of updates, what we do is you know, we model them as a deletion followed by an insertion. Uh, that means that over time, you'll have files like these uh, that have invalidation lists, and they have the actual parquet file with data. Now, one effect of this is you can end up, over time, uh, with some of these segments having very few rows that are still valid, and the rest have been deleted over time or updated and migrated to another, another location. So to improve efficiency under the covers, we're monitoring the situation. And uh, when we file, find situations like this, what we do is, uh, as we are kind of collecting new changes into our in-memory buffer, 
Then we'll take the few remaining rows that are still good here, push them here, collect them along with the rest of the changes, and then push all of these into the next parquet file that we, that we flesh out. And then, you know, once we also flesh the manifest that says, you know, which files are good, then we can just get rid of this file altogether. And then uh, that way we, we don't let the efficiency of the store kind of drift over time. Another consideration is, you know, one of the great things about Cosmos DB is the ability to have a globally distributed database that is just handled for you under the covers. We want to preserve this property with an analytical store. For the parquet files, what we can do is we can physically replicate the files, and that, that means less CPU used overall, less packing and unpacking of the rows, so we can more efficiently kind of ship these files around. And the net result of this is that you can choose where you run your analytics, whatever is closest to the rest of your application that runs that workflow, or uh, whatever is appropriate for the context of your application. You know, some of the great characteristics of Cosmos DB are ultra low latency for queries and updates and global distribution. So we want to preserve all of these characteristics. I just described how global distribution is preserved. And for ultra low latency, one thing we want to make sure is that we don't disrupt the transactional workload when the analytical store is enabled. And we do this through this flow, because in the end, when writes come here, we push them locally, we push them into our in-memory buffer, and then we're done. We can return. Later on, the rest of the process will take care of making sure this makes it to the analytical store. So that means that these parts are well isolated, where stores are different, and even the compute that you use, the compute for the analytical store, is completely separate from the transactional compute that we use to process requests. It's whatever engine that you're using that is accessing the analytical store directly, completely independent of this. So to recap, Synapse Link for Cosmos DB allows you to build applications the way you always did, but at the same time, enable the ability for Synapse and any of its analytical engines, like Spark and SQL Serverless, to access that data directly and in a way that is natural for the analytics stack. And you can do all of that while maintaining great separation between the two, so one workload will not disrupt any of the others, and all the great characteristics of Cosmos DB are all maintained. I hope this was an interesting peek into the internals of how we've accomplished Synapse Link. Thank you. Thank you, Pablo. I love being able to see this mapped out in that visual way. He did an amazing job of showing us the power of Synapse Link. Thank you so much, Pablo. Charles Lamana talked with us about building differentiated SaaS apps with the Microsoft Cloud. Now we have Satish Thomas. Let's see, where's he going to take it? Satish? Welcome to the session. My name is Satish Thomas. I'm the Vice President for the Microsoft Industry Cloud and Solutions Engineering Team. And today, we're going to double click into how all of you as developers can leverage uh, the Microsoft Industry Cloud and more broadly, the Microsoft Cloud to accelerate building use cases and applications. Now, over the last year, we've actually brought a few industry clouds to market, specifically healthcare, financial services, nonprofit, and we've announced previews for retail and manufacturing as well. Now, let me show you what that layer cake looks like and more importantly, how all of you can leverage it. Azure, which is our planet scale infrastructure, uh, cloud infrastructure. And then on top of it, we've obviously got a few more pieces. We've got Dynamics 365, we've got GitHub, we've got the Power Platform, and we've got Microsoft 365. Atop of all of this, obviously, we've got Dataverse, and more importantly, all of this data that is stored in Dataverse is actually in schematized form in the form of Microsoft Common Data Model, which is CDM. Now, on top of that, as part of the Microsoft Industry Clouds, we've actually tailored and built connectors, data models, and components that are tailored for each industry. For example, in the case of healthcare, we have an Azure uh, Fire Connector that allows you to bring in data from your EMR system and schematize it, make it useful to build use case on top of it. As an ISV, you can actually, there's a couple of scenarios or as a developer that you can kind of do. You can either leverage all of this and connect to it, and, and I'll go through a few examples of this, or you can basically take what we have and extend it. And this is one of my favorite sayings, which is, you know, go as high as you can, but go and, and go as low as you need to. So if you're able to leverage all of this goodness and don't need to rebuild a lot of these things, more power to you. You can spend more time building those industry-tailored use cases versus having to build up the Lego pieces. Uh, and then, of course, there's a lot of cases where you can extend or 
build across. So if you want to build a SaaS application or a full-blown application leveraging any of these um, uh, layers that we have in the Microsoft Cloud, that is also possible. So this is where you, know, you can fully build it, extend it, or connect to it because all of this data is sitting in the Microsoft Cloud that you can fully connect to. Right? So this is at the highest level, again, going back to you know, planet scale, uh, infrastructure cloud in terms of Azure, Dynamics 365, GitHub Power, the Power Platform, Microsoft 365, all in schematized form. So we've got each of these industry clouds comes with uh, with the data model that we've built that's kind of standardized. So as you can see across all of the Microsoft cloud and the industry tailored pieces we have in the across configurations, connectors, and data models, one of the things that becomes super important is for each industry, you know, there's, there's specific data sources uh, that you need to connect to. There might be custom systems in your organization that is specific to uh, an industry, and you're, uh, you, know, you can do that very easily uh, at this layer. But more importantly, you're able to use the full Microsoft Cloud, and you can use what is relevant or go as high as you need and, and leverage most of it. So that's one of the things, you know, if you look at each of the industry clouds that we brought to market across healthcare, uh, financial services, nonprofit, manufacturing, retail. You know, we want we want to go as as high as you can, so that we enable our developers to kind of focus on those use cases versus having to worry about uh, the Lego pieces that that go into it. So one of the examples I wanted to cover was actually one of our partners, uh, Mesa Global, that actually built a vaccine management solution on top of our Microsoft Cloud for Healthcare. So if you look at what was done there. You know, there's three kind of use cases where across the patient, across the vaccinator, and across the back office. So what Mazic Global did here is, again, leveraging the, the Microsoft Cloud for Healthcare, using our data model, was able to build experiences using our Power Platform, by the way, across the patient experience, the vaccinated experience, and the back office. So um, as many of you might have gone through the workflow when you got vaccinated, you know, this is a solution that one of our partners, Mazic Global, very quickly got into market because they were able to leverage most of this versus having to rebuild it. And most of the time was focused on making sure that that patient experience uh, was excellent, that vaccinated experience met the needs of the customers, uh, which is essentially states, counties, and governments across the world. And those back office scenarios were able to kind of build, build very quickly. Again, leveraging the Microsoft Cloud for Healthcare, the data model that we had, the connectors that we had, um, et cetera, out of the box. One more thing that's actually pretty critical about this this end-to-end -end solution is Mazic was able to leverage and build connectors to EMRs, which is electronic medical record systems, using the connector framework we had. Again, being able to land that data uh, in the Microsoft Cloud to be able to leverage to use for those use cases. Go fast, and one of my favorite quotes is, you know, from Mazic is they were able to 10x their time to market because they were able to re, uh, leverage as much uh, all of this from the Microsoft Cloud for Healthcare without having to rebuild it. And it's not just in the case of healthcare, right? So a lot of ISVs like Mazic Care deal with other industries as well, like education, and the same kind of model uh, works for each of those industries as well as we bring them to market. But there's more. So the specific example that I showed you is how you know somebody like Mazic was able to use the Microsoft Cloud for Healthcare and accelerate those use cases around vaccine management. Every industry has, you know, across each of the pillars, right? It's all about building a deep understanding of the customer, engaging with the customers intelligently, transforming your operations, and then finally empowering your employees to engage with your customers intelligently. So if you look at each of those four pillars, you know, when you think about it, building a deep understanding of the customer, we have a product called Dynamics 365 Customer Insights, which you can leverage as part of this full uh, Microsoft Cloud to be able to build that uh, customer profile without having to do it yourself. Uh, when you want to engage with your customers, you can leverage uh, another product we have within Dynamics 365, just to pick an example, Dynamics 365 for marketing. Uh, similarly, to transform your operations, there's something uh, in the Microsoft Cloud. And then finally, you know, when you think about frontline engagements right, with your customers, you can leverage what we have in Teams to, to basically build that user experience if that is a use case uh, that is relevant in your industry uh, or in your region. So Uber point, you know, you can go as high as you can uh, to basically build the, the use cases uh, that are valuable in your industry, or you can go as low as you need to, uh, and there's that full power 
uh, that's available to you as part of the Microsoft Cloud and the Microsoft Industry Cloud uh, atop of it. In addition to that example, we also have other partners such as uh, Aftex, who's a T-Tech company that were able to gain a lot of impressive gains in terms of time to value. Uh, for customers, you know, that were going through a tremendous change over the last year, you know, specifically retail, manufacturing, and healthcare companies. Um, so there's there's many uh, similar scenarios where, you know, companies and developers and SIs and ISVs were able to leverage all of these things to, to, to realize those use cases uh, faster than they would have been otherwise. So... Obviously, you know, these are just a few examples. And like I said, you know, this is a huge investment for us as a company. Uh, we have the Microsoft Cloud for Healthcare out there. We've announced preview for financial services, retail, manufacturing, nonprofit. And you, and you can assume that we'll do a lot more. So hopefully those two examples gave you a little bit of view in terms of, and, and some real world examples of how partners and developers out there are leveraging the Microsoft uh, Industry Cloud to accelerate their time to market. Uh, and meet the needs of uh, customers across every industry in every region. So we're just getting started, and you can go learn more at ak.ms slash industry clouds, uh, and we can't wait to see what all of you do with our industry clouds. Thank you. Thank you, Satish. That was fascinating. You always have such insights. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for joining us for this brand new way of sharing information with you. Double Click with Microsoft Engineering Leaders was created so that we could pull back the curtain on some of these key announcements and see how things actually work. Satish had an amazing session. Pablo shared with us about Synapse Link. Pierce proved to me that I can improve my own developer productivity with the new Velocity tools. And of course, Brendan with GitOps Automation was impactful. Now, let's go enjoy the rest of Build. There's so much here to see and do and learn, and I'm excited to do it with you. Thanks for joining. See you soon.